I was feeling feelings that no girl should feel at seven years old. The older I got, the more graphic the assault got. Everyone just thought, oh, she's being a teenager, but no one really knew the pain. I remember saying, if men want to look at me, it's going to be when I say so, and it's not going to be for free. I'm not going to lie. In the beginning, it was fun. All these guys are flaunting. All these guys want to dance with you. All these guys want to throw their money at you. I gave the DJ my ticket so that he could announce me. And I waited for my regular. He always wanted to have this crazy spiritual experience. So I started my dance. I had turned around and when I turned back around, my regular wasn't my regular anymore. Hello and welcome back to the Almost False Podcast where I interview regular people with incredible stories. Today's guest had quite a tumultuous life. She was abused at a very young age, which eventually led her into the strip club, but that career came to a sudden halt when she saw something straight out of a nightmare. She is the host of the Daughters of Zion podcast, and I am incredibly grateful to have had the opportunity to talk to her. So now that the stage is set, let's dive right into the story of Amanda Tora. Yeah, so um, when I met my biological dad, um, I remember right off the bat, he introduced me to his daughters and his uh, side of the family, um, which added to that feeling of, okay, where do I belong? Because on this side, I'm not, you know, fully, you know, blood. And on this side, I'm not fully blood either. So I kind of felt like, okay, the oddball, like, where do I really fit? Like, where is my place? And once I met my half siblings on the other side, you know, they were the same age as me. So I wanted to play. I wanted to go hang out with her. And um, so we started doing play dates. And that's when the molestation began happening at night. You know, my mom gained trust. You know, little did her wildest dream was she ever imagine that, you know, someone's biological father would do this to their little girl. And so she trusted him. And, you know, she was like, okay, she deserves a father that, you know, where she feels right. And so we started meeting in secret. So my stepfather did not know that I knew who my biological dad was. It was always, you know, keep it a secret, keep it hush. If he finds out, he's going to be upset. So um, I would go see my half sister and I would go see my biological father in secrecy, you know, every weekend. And that's when the molestation began to happen at night. Um, It really took place. From when I was seven years old all the way till I hit puberty at 12 years old. So whenever we would go spend the night, that's when the molestation would happen. Um, When I was sleeping, um, he would come into the room and um, assault me. And this kind of just like really like put me in a mindset of like isolation. Whenever I was home by myself, I always felt like I was alone. I would go to my room. I would play with my dolls or I was just always in my own head in myself because once that started happening i just didn't really know how to connect anymore i was feeling feelings that no girl should feel at seven years old um when i started going through my body started changing i started getting hips um it was almost like i felt this way like But then it was like I felt shameful. I felt disgusted. So I just didn't know what to do with these emotions. So I shut in. And my stepdad was a believer. So I, you know, would be in around the church, not really listening or paying attention. But I remember one day my stepdad came home with a book by Rick Warren. And it was called The Purpose Driven Life. And I remember at that time grabbing that book, not knowing what it meant, but knowing it has some kind of significance to it and putting it in my backpack and taking it with me to school. And I would take it with me to my biological dad's house and I would put it in my night bag. And, you know, this kind of went on and went on and went on. I never read the book. I just always kept it with me. And it went on and went on. I would lock the door at night. You know, I would sometimes I would block, you know, things in front of the door and somehow some way he always make it back into the room and I just felt like just disgusted I remember like during this season my mom got really sick she ended up um, being in the hospital you know she almost died twice during this season I remember my whole family got played with boils like boils like those big sores broke out on all of us during this time and it just kind of shows you the kind of place I was in mentally. Not only was I like, what's happening to me? Already feeling disgusted and shamed and like 
bound to my secret. You know, not only did I was not supposed to tell anybody that I knew who my biological dad was, but now I can't even say what this man is doing to me. On top of me being bound to secrecy, now I'm bound to being disgusted in my body. I got sores breaking out. They're taking us to the doctor. You know, they're popping these big boy. Like, I was just like, so numb is the word that I'm going to say. Like, though I could be spilling all these emotions out and acting out around that age before I hit puberty, I was pretty much a good girl, just solid. Yeah, that's the, it's the defense mechanism of being numb. Because you don't have any other choice, especially at that age, you have no idea what's happening. And you said earlier, you were already isolated before meeting your biological dad. Before all of that happened, you already felt like you didn't really have anyone to go to. Your mom probably was the only one that you could talk to because you were 100% related to her, but she got sick. And so you, on top of having to deal with these things that no one should ever have to deal with and that are extremely hard to deal with on their own you were all alone and had no one even if you wanted to talk about it right she was um for most of that time that i was um going through that she was in the hospital so most of the time was you know her recovering and if my mom wasn't sick or in the hospital she was working at a factory to make ends meet so that kind of tells you kind of like i didn't have that outlet to say it and that's one. And two, I was afraid. I was afraid of what was going to happen if I did say something. I was afraid how she was going to react, that she was going to make a scene. I was afraid to break her heart, especially since she was so sick. You know, mm -hmm. I had just got her back home. We almost lost her twice. Like she went through extensive, extensive, you know, surgery in her abdomen. So I was afraid to upset her or say something or 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 like just break her heart and then I lose her forever um so that's kind of like my mentality too of why I just shut in even more yeah and at some point when you were 12 or 13 at that age you said that it stopped so what happened for it to stop and at the same time the other question I have is how did those years impact you in the years after that in your teenage years? Yes. Yeah, so the older I got, the more graphic the assault got. I believe that the only reason it really stopped is when I came to puberty at the age of 12. As soon as I got my period, um, he fled to another state. And I never really talked to him after that. Um, I remember having um, one or two conversations with him later on in the years. And just basically shaming me, calling me dirty, calling me nasty. And I never again spoke to him. So once that happened, I was, you know, ditching school, breaking rules and just, you know, going out of control. And everyone just thought, oh, she's being a teenager. But no one really knew the pain. No one really knew what was deep, deep, deep down inside that was driving me to do these things. I was angry. I was pissed off. You know, I had all these strong restrictions, all these strong rules. And the only time I could go out, you know, a few years back was when I would go out and get assaulted. So it was like I was at home. And if I wasn't at home, I was at this um, person's house, my biological dad's house. And that's when the assaults would happen. So that was like the only bit of freedom that I would get. So when all of that happened, when he left, when he moved, and I started getting to high school and I got like that little taste of freedom. I just went wild. And it kind of was like that up until I hit the age of 16 where I encountered Jesus. And I remember one day, it was the day that I made it a decision in my heart that I was going to give my life to Jesus. Um, I remember I was on the bus this day. Um, for whatever reason, I did it. I think I woke up late and she couldn't take me to school. But I remember um, being on the CTA bus to go to high school. And I was heartbroken because the guy that I was with, I just found out that he had cheated on me and he had got someone else pregnant. So I remember on the phone with my sister just crying and it was raining. And she was just on the phone. And she was like, Amanda, you're searching for something. And the only person that can give you what you're searching for is Jesus. Like, you just need to stop and surrender. And I was just at a place in my life where I was just so broken. Like, the weed didn't fill my void. 
nothing just really made me feel like alive anymore. So as she was talking in my mind, I was like, yeah, you know, Jesus does sound good right now at this moment. Like I tried everything else. Why not? And I remember as I was on the phone with her, this man gets on the bus and he resembled my biological dad so much. And there was a seat open next to me. I was sitting by the window and um, he walked on the bus and he sat next to me and he put his rain jacket like over his lap, but it kind of covered my lap too. And I didn't really think anything of it. I was just like, all these seats are open. You're going to come sit next to me. And the bus starts taking off. And then he, I just started feeling a hand on my thigh. And this man that was sat next to me, he started groping me. And I was still on the phone with my sister. And I remember like pulling the next stop string. And I was just like, uh-uh. I told him, get up. And then I stood up and I got off the bus. And I was like, that's it. That's it. I was like, after today, that's it. I'm giving my life to God because this enough is enough, right? And I remember calling up all my friends and I was like, hey, do you want to match my bottle? Do you want to match my blunt? I still got like a fifth of Hennessy. You know, if you want to hang out with me today, today, do it because tomorrow I'm going to disappear for a little bit. So in my mind, I was like, okay, I'm going to do everything that I want to do tonight. And then up tomorrow, I'm going to go whole turkey. I'm not going to smoke anymore. I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm not going to party. I'm going to give my life to God tomorrow. But today, I'm going to make sure I see all my friends, make sure I, I hit up everyone who I need to hit up. And then tomorrow, my life is changing. And so I was that. And I remember walking up to my mirror. And I was like, Jesus, like, come and do in my life what everyone says you can do. Like, I'm ready. Like, please, what everyone else says that you can do, come and do it in my life. I'm ready. And from that day forward, I took that seriously. But even better, God took that seriously. And so ever since then, I I remember going to church the next day. And my dad, my stepdad was so excited because, remember, he begged us to go to church. He was forced us to go to church. But this Sunday was different. I got up because I wanted to. So that was a radical transition from being totally broken and then you didn't want anything to do with God and Jesus because your, your uh, stepdad had tried and probably at that point your sister was also your sisters were also trying and you didn't want anything to do with it you got to rock bottom and you're like I'm, I'm ready to try this thing and it changed your life but that's not the end of the story it's not the beautiful story and then everything went perfect after it's actually quite the opposite so what happened mm -hmm. for you to go to a radical change to praying for people, preaching about Jesus, and then doing a total 180 and heading in the complete other direction later? Yes, absolutely. It was completely opposite. Um, so I basically what I did was I used Jesus um, as a cover up and I suppressed my pain deep, deep, deep down low. Now. Mind you, the way that me and God were, he started taking me through um, an inner healing process during this time. And he started dealing with the rejection, with the wounds, and everything was going good. I would, you know, meet up with, you know, prophets and um, have counseling done within the body of the church. And I remember this one particular day, um, I think I was two years into my healing walk. I was around 18 at this time. And I remember doing a session and the prophet had brought up, mind you, no one knew my secret, not my sister, not my pastors, not my mother, not my father. No one knew that I, who had molested me and how long it happened. No one knew I was carrying this around. So when the prophet that I was sitting across that was doing an inner healing session with me had brought up what happened to me and told me that God said that he wanted me to forgive him. Literally, I felt like I got exposed. And I remember looking at the prophet and I said, hell no. It's like everything that I was suppressing literally came flooding back. And I looked at him and I was like, hell no. I was like, God, you must be out of your mind. And I got up from that table and I left. I left the church. I literally went ghost. I went back to smoking 
I went back to drinking. And I want to say this because it wasn't like a night and day transition. It went, and this is, you know, so important to know because um, you need to recognize when you're slipping back. It went from me not wanting to go to church. It went from me not wanting to pray and open up my Bible. It went from me not wanting to answer my sisters in Christ text message or when people from church would call me, I wouldn't answer. But when the wrong people began to call me, I would answer. So it was like a gradual like, uh. but it happened in less than a month. I was smoking again. I was drinking again. I was showing up at parties again, you know, places that I had completely like let go of and freed myself from. I, I went back to those places, you know, and I had to deal with the mockery. I had to be like, oh, look at the church girls back. You know, I had to deal with, you know, those um, jokes and stuff. But I was so mad at God that I didn't even let that get to my head. I was so upset with God because in my mind, I was like, God, you saw. You saw what happened to me. You saw what I went through. And you want me to forgive him? Like you read, you, did you not see what he did to me? Your little girl. I didn't ask for that. You saw the mess that I got into. You saw the pornography that I got into. You saw the rejection that he left me with. Are you out of your mind? And I think what set me over the edge was, I remember this one time I was trying to get a car and my stepdad was like, well, you're not going to church no more. You're not living right. You know, you're not doing the things right. Why am I going to sit here and bless you if you're not on the right steps? You're like wiling out. You're not being responsible. So I remember out of the blue, my stepfather called me. Not my stepfather. My biological father called me out of the blue. And I remember when he called me, I was already working and I was like, hey, I'm trying to get my car. I'm trying to get my first car. You know, I'm tired of taking the bus. The winter's coming. It's it's really hard. You know, could you help me out at least with a down payment? You know, could you the least you can do is help me get my first car after everything you stole from me. Right. The least you can do is making sure that I'm safe and not, you know, on a CTA bus that I have my own vehicle. And he was like, nope. Nope. And I heard that you have little boyfriends and I heard, you you know, you're nasty or dirty. And I hung up the phone and I was like, OK. Yeah, because he used you as an object from the time where you were seven. And that's kind of like all that he had done with you is just use you as an object of whatever he wanted to do. And that didn't change. And that's the root of all the problems that you had and he wasn't ready to do anything. So I imagine that at that time you were already heading down the wrong path. You were already in a dark place that probably set you a lot further down than what you already were. Yeah. It, it, it like triggered a whole new level of pain. I remember, you know, making up in my mind, like, okay, men ain't going to use me anymore. And I was like, I'm not going to let men look at my body for free. I'm not going to let anyone take advantage of me anymore. So I was making inner vows. And I remember saying, if men want to look at me, if men want to take you know, me for pleasure, it's going to be, when I say so, in my control, and it's not going to be for free. So I remember going to the strip club with some of my friends that I had reconnected with at this time. And we had applied. And... um we started dancing and not only did we start dancing, but the shame that I felt because I knew this is not what God wanted me to do. The, like I knew that if God were to come right now and find me where I was, he would not be happy. And so not only did, um, was I in like a completely different place, the drug use got worse. So I went from, you know, just using, um, weed and, and liquor to you know to numb that i ended up going to even harder drugs i started doing cocaine at this time because in the clubs that that's what they do they get coked out they get drunk they get high to um really get yourself in a mentality to do what you're doing and be okay with it because I, I imagine none of the girls that are there are there because they think it's the right thing to do either they're there because no they feel like they have no other choice or 
some are probably like you too uh, that have the same mentality but i doubt that a lot of girls are working in strip clubs because that's what they wanted to do with their life and that's the best thing that they think of right um so i think when you go into a club there's two types of women that you're going to encounter you're going to encounter the one who's influenced by social media you know who's influenced by the cardi b's who are influenced you know by the young miami kind of you know culture that's out there and think it's cute and then you're going to encounter the other ones who are in pain you know who need this income to get by and who are just trying to survive which whatever that looks like so there are people who think like it's a persona it's a job and then there's other people who are like just lost and like doing it because they need to get by at any okay. cost. but for you it was a little bit of both because you went there because you were broken but you also got attached and you also wanted the glamour life and the instagram lifestyle that we see everywhere so for you it was kind of it, i don't know if it was there in the beginning but it became a mixture of these two right i honestly i think it was it, it definitely um I wanted to be independent. I wanted to, you know, buy my first car on my own. I didn't want to depend on a man to do it, especially after that previous conversation that I had with my biological father. Um, I wanted to get my own money. I'm not going to lie. In the beginning, it was fun when I was, you know, drunk high and I got into that persona and I got into that character. I had fun with it. And it wasn't until God started showing up there that I started feeling convicted and like, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? So the beginning of it, I enjoyed it. I had my friends there. I had my girls there. We would be drunk, you know, and it felt good. It kind of felt like you were wanted. So you see how the devil plays on that. All those years of feeling rejected, all of those years of feeling like, where do I belong? All those years of feeling like I'm out of place. Now I'm in this position. I'm right in the devil's playground. And what is the first thing that he does? He makes you feel wanted. He makes you feel like you're accepted. He makes you feel like, yes, all these guys are flaunting. All these guys want to dance with you. All these guys want to throw their money at you. You know, everyone's looking. You're like the star of the show. You know, everyone's, you know, wants to come here, come here. Like he makes you feel wanted, right? And that's where the deception takes place. And if you're not careful, you can really get caught up in that. And the irony in this is that those people at the club were treating you the same as what your biological dad was treating you when you were a child. He was using you for his own pleasure, mm -hmm. his own sexual pleasure. And then in order for you to get accepted, you went to people that were doing the same thing, were using you for their sexual pleasures. So that's the ironic thing about it. But because you had walked with Jesus before, you knew that what you were doing was wrong. So you could ignore it. But deep down in your heart, you knew you had this intuition. And talking about intuition, I want to get to this other story that you lived while you were working at the club. Because there's one night, and that's that I know that's a big turning point in your life. There's one night where um, you had this intuition not to go somewhere. A little bit like what what we just talked about. You knew that it was wrong, and you still went. And a whole lot of things happened. So I want you to get into that if you can. Oh my goodness! Yeah. So. You're right. You know, I deep, deep down inside knew it wasn't wrong. And it didn't help that, you know, the Holy Spirit started coming to me in the car and he would try to talk to me, you know, up before my shifts of work. And I, I would remember driving down the highway and the Holy Spirit, you know, I would just feel his presence flood my car. And he would be like, Amanda, come back, come back. And I would be like, no, I'm not going to forgive him. I'm not going to do what you want me to do. And I would, I remember hitting my blunt taking a bump, taking a shot and going into work and doing my thing. So that kind of went on for, I want to say about six months. It was, um, Holy Spirit would come, I would ignore him and he would go and then he would come back again. And I think the turning point of my story is really what you're uh, mentioning now is there was just one night I was hanging out with one of my friends and we were, um, leaving, um, this party session at a studio and it was already five in the morning. And I had told her, you know, let's go home. And she's like, wait, wait, but I want to chill with these guys. Let's chill with these guys. And as she was on the phone with them, we were getting gas. And I just had this 
this bad, bad, bad feeling in my gut. Like I wanted to like throw up. And I remember I could hear God saying, don't go. And I would tell her, I told her, I looked at her. I'm like, it's already five in the morning. We're already drunk. We got to go to work tomorrow. Let's just go home. And she was like, no, no, come on, come on. Like, at least drop me off. At least drop me off. So I was like, fine, I'm not going to stay, but I'll drop you off. And as we were driving and I was getting closer, that feeling kept getting stronger. And I just remember just feeling like, don't go, don't go. And I like I could feel like if God put a stamp and he was like, don't go. But I still went. And I remember turning into the alley and she was like putting my car in park. Um, I didn't turn it off, but I put it, put it in park. And I remember she was on this on the passenger side. She was getting her purse. She had already opened her door. She was drunk. So we were slow and she was getting the rest of her bottle. She was getting her things together, her phone. And out of nowhere, a girl runs to her side of the car and starts swinging on her. And next thing you know, another girl runs on my side of the car and she starts swinging on me through the window. So I start fighting back. The guy that had set up the whole thing ended up opening my car door and dragged us out. So we were fighting. He ended up taking my keys out of the ignition and threw them. And while we were fighting, I remember just like looking to my side because I was already ended up on the passenger side and I looked to my side and my friend was under the car um, by my car tire and the girl was on top of her and there was a guy there holding a big um, shotgun. And when I seen that, I'm still fighting, I'm still blocking, but in my head, I started talking to God and I was like, oh no, God, I can't die like this. If I die like this, if I die right now, I'm going to die backslidden and I'm never going to see you, God. I can't die like this. And I remember getting backed up to um, the garage door and I'm still fighting. And I was like, God, if I die like this, I'm not going to be able to say bye to my mom. I'm not going to be able to be in eternity with you, God. Like, I don't want to die how I'm living right now. Like, I can't die right now. And as I was saying that to God while I'm still fighting her, um, I felt something cold pressed up against my stomach. And when I looked down, it was the guy that had was hitting the other girl with the shotgun. He was already at me. And he was standing there with um, the shotgun pressed up against me. And I was backed up into the garage. And I said one last prayer. And I said, God, if you take me out of this situation, I promise, God, I promise I'm going to come back to you. And right at that moment, it literally fell. And you could literally see a force field coming between me and the people with the gun and the girl that was hitting me. And in that moment, I the guy that had orchestrated the whole uh, meetup was like, stop. And when he said stop, everyone dispersed. Now you ha have to understand how powerful that is. Because if you've ever been in a fight, if you've ever been in a scenario where someone's fighting, you have to pull them apart for them to stop. You have to be yelling and be like, hey, 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 hey. But this man spoke with the kind of authority that is God given. And he was like, stop. And when he said stop, everyone dispersed. You've seen the girls get up. You've seen the guy with the shotgun go back. And she was in my car before I was even able to get in my car. The audacity. But we're cool now. <laughs> but I remember going to my car and trying to drive off, but my keys weren't there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, Lord, my keys aren't here. Like, where are they? And then I looked to the side and they were like illuminated right by the garbage can. So I got out of the car really quick. Thank God he didn't shoot. Um, and, but he was threatening. He was like, you guys got two minutes. If you're not out of here in two minutes, I'm going to blow your heads off. Like y'all need to go now, now, now. And I got back in the car, I took off, and we just drove off into the night. And you would think that after that situation that I would, like, step into my senses and snap out of what I was doing and get back in alignment with God, but I didn't. Well, the first question I want to ask before we get too far down the line is because I have no idea why someone would just randomly attack you. Was there a reason did you know them prior? Why did they just randomly attack you as you were trying to get out of your car? Yeah, so I think it was more of I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, they had a situation going where they were together with 
you know, the same guy and she was going up to meet the guy, but his other girlfriend was there and they ended up setting her up. So I think it was a matter of just being there, wrong place, wrong time. I feel like if she was with anybody else, the same thing probably would have happened to whoever else she was with. Um, this girl was just known for trouble following her. I mean, I was in car accidents with her where I should have flew out of the windshield and I didn't. Um, so there was a lot of like crazy stuff that happened around this girl. Um, but I think it was I was at the wrong place at the wrong time and God tried to tell me not to go. Okay. It explains a lot. You uh, got caught, caught in crossfire, essentially, which uh, puts a lot of things more clear in my head. But let's go back to what you were talking about. You said it wasn't a transition overnight. Um, it was a process for you to get back to God. So uh, tell me a little bit more about that period of your life. Yeah. So you would think after that situation, I would like snap into my senses and come back and keep my promise to God. I think a lot of the times when we find ourselves in a tough situation and we need God to get us out that jam, you know, that we make these promises. But once we're out of like the danger zone, we kind of like go back and we kind of forget and we kind of ease off. So that's kind of the place that I found myself in because I knew if I had to go back, if I had to come back to God, if I had to um, come back to church, I knew that I was going to have to forgive him. And I just was not ready to do that. And you're right, like how you said in the beginning, like I was so caught up in this illusion that I was in control. But in all reality, I was doing the same thing that I hated my biological dad for doing. I was entertaining men for money for the same thing that my biological dad used to do to me. It was older men looking at young girls. That's absolutely right what you're saying. And we talked about it earlier, so I don't want to rehash the same thing. But um, that situation where you, essentially God saved your life, you promised that you would go back to him if he did. He did. And now you were put in that situation of doing these things, and it was hard for you to accept because you weren't put in that corner anymore. But your heart started softening. And... It wasn't immediately after, but there was another event that happened where it was kind of the last drop that made you run back to God. And that night was another night that was very intense for you. So I want to hear exactly what happened. Yeah. So um, I would say that after that night with the gun incident, um, I started being a little bit more receptive to God's voice where before I would, you know, feel him come in my car or feel him try to talk to me and just completely like harden my heart to him. But it was after that incident that I started giving God a little bit more room, you know, giving him a little bit more attention. And I remember this one day I was driving to work. I was driving to the strip club and I was listening to my music and then all of a sudden I felt God's presence just rush into my car again. But this time it was so different. He was like, Amanda, come home. I miss you. And when I heard him say that, I literally like just like started crying. I was like, God, I know I miss you too, but I can't. I can't do what you're asking me to do. I can't forgive him, God. You know, God. And he was like, baby girl, I know. Because he calls me baby girl. He was like, I know. <laughs> I know you can't, but I'll help you. And when he said that, I didn't say anything back. I just kind of took that and put it in my pocket. And I remember parking my car, hitting my blunt, taking a shot grabbing my work bag and heading into the club to the dressing room to dress up. And I started my night like normal. I got changed. I did my hair. I did my makeup. I checked in. I went out to the dance floor. I gave the DJ my ticket so that he could announce me. And I waited for my regular. And I had a regular who would come in every week. And every time he would come, now thinking back on it, it's kind of crazy. Every time he would come, he always wanted to have this crazy spiritual experience. Um, and I never put much thought to it. I was just like, okay, you're going to help me meet my quota for the night so that I don't have to owe back house at the end of my shift. Um, 
but he would come in with anklets. He would come in with gifts and presents all the time. And every time we would dance, he would always say these, you know, little chants and, you know, look at me in my eyes and stuff. And I was just like, okay, maybe this is his thing. Maybe this is his fetish. This is just what he's into. And as an entertainer, you know, your job is to fulfill their fantasy. So I never really thought much of it or him um, until this night. And I remember the DJ called me on stage. I did my set and I came back down and he was waiting for me by the bar. And we did our usual. We started the night off. We went to the back. We did a five for 50 dance and I was going to start my dance like I normally do. And I, I want to like paint a picture really quick because I need you guys to understand how dramatic this was. Um, the rooms are, they have curtains and it's just a chair with a carpet and a little stand right there where you put your money and your keys, your car, whatever that they have in their pockets. And it's red light. So it's like all dark except for red light. And the walls were black and he sat down and he did his thing. And the bouncer that checks in all the way at the front. So we're like in the corner room all the way in the back. And the bouncer that checks us in for the dance is all the way at the front. So we go, we close the curtain and I start doing my thing. I turned around and I'm drunk, I'm high, but I'm still like in my senses. I'm like, lit enough to the point where I can perform and be loose, but not to the point where I'm like, don't know what's going on. Like I'm still in my right mind. I can still drive it, can still focus, but I took enough to take like the edge off, to take that heaviness that I was feeling coming into work. Yeah. And you were doing that often too. This important to mention it, that it was your routine. You were doing that right. every time you were going to work. Oh my it's goodness. Not that night that you did something different. That was the same thing as you were always doing. It was every the same night. guy that you were always seeing. Every night. Mind you, I was smoking drinks since I was 14. Like this was not something that I was like a lightweight, you know, like this is stuff I've always done. So I was still in my right mind, but I wasn't like, ugh, down. So I started my dance. I had turned around and when I turned back around, because he was sitting in the chair watching, when I turned back around, the Holy Spirit allowed me to see who I was really dancing for, who I was really entertaining. And when I turned to look at him, my regular wasn't my regular anymore. He still had a human body of a man. He was still wearing what he was wearing, but his face was distorted. He had sharp teeth his eyes were like black and he just had this this nasty look on his face like this nasty uh perverted lust like but the kind of lust where you're like oh my god i'm in trouble kind of like don't look at me like that like i literally like felt like fear and like disgust like blood over me I was so afraid of what I was seeing that I literally like grabbed my heels and I ran back to the dressing room. I left him there. And as I was running through the crowd, it was packed. It was a Friday night. It was a Friday or Saturday night. So the club was packed. And I remember um, some older guys were like by the bar and they turned around. They were reaching out. They're like, hey, let's go get a two for 25. But as I was looking at them, I was literally seeing them in the spirit realm so i was literally seeing the spirits that they were carrying i was literally seeing the demonic presence that were on him even the women there was like women that were on stage and their face was like flashing and distorting and i like was like sweating i was like getting flashes i i like completely like ran to the back and i remember as i was running through the back the doors were swinging behind me and I got into the dressing room and there was girls still getting ready because, mind you, I had just started my shift. It had to be like um, close to midnight around there. And uh, I remember some girls were still getting ready and the floor runners were there. And they're like, come on, everybody out to the dance floor. The owner's watching. The owner's watching. Like, we need all dancers to the floor, all dancers to the floor. Come on, girl. Come on. And I was like, I can't, I feel sick. I'm not going out there. I feel disgusted. And I was just sweating. I felt like my life was like, literally like I was getting hot flashes. And I remember just sitting there and I just felt so hot and everyone had left the room. And as soon as everyone left the room, I felt the Holy Spirit come into the dressing room. 
And I was still so like freaked out of my mind. And I was like, God, I don't want to be here no more. God, I don't want to do this anymore. God, get me out of here, God. God, if you get me out of here, Lord, I promise I'm so serious this time. If you get me out of here, God, I promise I'll leave. I'll forgive him, God. I'll forgive him, God. I'll do what it needs to do, God. I know that it's going to be hard, but if you get me out of here, God, God, if you get me out of here right now, God, I'll follow you. I don't care. Just get me out of here because I'm afraid. I'm afraid, God. And I heard him, he was like, come on, let's go. And I remember getting changed really fast. I grabbed my bags. I didn't even pay house because you have to pay to check in and you have to pay to check out. I didn't wait for the bouncer to walk me to my car because you had to wait for them to walk you to your car and let, in case there were stalkers, in case there were guys watching you, watching the parking lot because the parking lot where we parked at was on this side and the parking lot that the customers parked at was on this side. So it was literally like anyone okay. can just walk there. So normally there was a bouncer in the middle door that would watch the women smoke cigarettes and then I walked them to the car at the end of the shift. I didn't care about none of that. I had the Holy Spirit with me. I ran to my car and I never looked back. And as I remember, as I was driving home, I was like, oh my God, Lord, this is crazy. I don't even have a job. How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to pay my bills? I'm the one who's supporting myself right now. This was my job. Um, the man that I'm living with right now, because I was in a new relationship. What is he going to think? He didn't meet me as a Christian. He don't know you. He don't know about this chapter of my life. Like, what is he going to think? Is he going to leave me? Like, at this point, I don't even care. I just know that I know what I saw. And I'm never going back to that. I'm never going back to that. And I remember driving home and I got in the house and I was just crying. I like walked in and I ran to my boyfriend and he was there playing on his PlayStation. And he was like, whoa, you're home early. And I remember just bawling to him. I was crying and I was crying and I was telling him how I didn't want to do this anymore. And I knew that it was God because he was like, that's okay. You don't have to dance. You don't have to be there. You'll find something else. Like, you, you know, I got you. And like, that was just the confirmation because that was something that I was asking God about in the car. Like, what is he going to think? You know, he didn't, he met me as this party girl. But little did I know that behind the scenes, as he was meeting my family, my family, my mom, my sisters, they would go to him and they would tell him, you know, this version of Amanda that you see, that's not her. This version, you know, we don't know what happened to her, but she was in church. She loved God. She used to be on the praise team. She was on the choir. She was on the worship team. She used to evangelize. She used to be involved in church. This Amanda, this stripper, this party girl, we don't know who that is. So my husband held on to that. He's my husband now, by the way. I give that away. So, so my boyfriend yeah. held on to that. And... He never brought it up, but he kept that in his back pocket. And when I got home, he was like, okay, you don't have to, you don't have to dance. We'll find something else for you. And he comforted me. And um, I was so serious about what I seen at that club. I was so serious about recommitting my life to God that I got ready for church the following day. And when I got to church, the pastor's wife came up to me. As I was walking in, and the first thing she said was, welcome home. Mind you, I've been gone for so many years. They knew what I was into. They knew what I was doing. And the first thing that she said to me was, welcome home. We missed you. And she gave me a hug. And later on during that church service, the pastor continued with his sermon. And he pulled out a wedding dress. And he was talking about how Jesus was going to come back for his bride. And he's looking for a bride with no stains. And he was filling the dress with stain and with dye. And he's like, this is what happened when you do this. And this is what happened when, you know, these situations happen in our life. And we allow it to damage us. Look at the dress is damaged. But he was like, when you apply the blood of Jesus, I don't know what type of dye he had. But he was wiping the dress and the black <laughs> dye was literally like coming off. And it was stainless. And he was saying, when you apply the blood of Christ, when you apply, apply what Jesus did for you on the cross, every stain is removed and he makes you white as snow and he prepares you for the wedding day. 
And I took that so seriously. I ran up to the altar and I recommitted my life back to God that day. And I remember coming home and I told my boyfriend, I didn't even wait. I was like, listen, I know you met me as a party girl. I know you didn't meet me as a Christian, but this is what I'm choosing now. I'm choosing to fully serve God. And, and I know this is not what you signed up for. And I know you're, you don't know who God is. I know this is not your, your, um, your thing. And if you don't want to follow me into this, I won't be mad at you. You know, you can stay in the living room until you find an apartment. We'll be friends. You know, we can go our own separate ways and, and that'll be fine. You know, I, you know, thank you for everything. But if you want to follow me, if you want to follow Christ, and if you want to, you know, do this new chapter, then we need to get married. That was quick. That was quick. And I, I can't imagine what that th his reaction was, because uh, this was a very sudden thing. He knew you as a stripper and you said your family had told him about who you were before, but he had never seen that version of you. And that one night, you flipped totally again, but even more intense than the first time. And you recommitted your life to God. Is it the next day or the, I think that's what you said, or at least the same week. And it was very, very sudden. And that time, because of what you saw in the strip club, there was no going back in your mind. That, that was it. The games were over and you were willing to do anything not to go back there. Yes. It literally felt like God tore the veil from my eye. Like every lie that the enemy was trying to dangle over me, that I was in power, that I was redeeming what happened to me by, you know, making sure no one took advantage of me. It was like God completely like opened my eye and tore the veil. Like it was like full blown revelation that I was like, okay, this is serious. My battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities. Like what is happening right now is serious. And I can't play about it. So it was like, it happened so quick that I can't even like really get too complex about it because it's a supernatural thing and we can't make it into a natural thing when it's a supernatural thing. And it it, it, it just happened that quick. That's all that it took for me to see. And I, I'll be honest, I didn't want to see anymore. But little did I know that the Lord was going to be preparing me you know, to cast out demons, to do deliverance. And that wasn't going to be the last demon that I was going to face in my life. And I had made up my mind. It was like, God was like, I'm not playing with you anymore. When God had to pull out the dad hat and was like, oh no, you're my daughter. Get back in the house. I'm not playing with you anymore. And I needed that. You know, God, his word says that he comforted us with his rod and his staff. So the shepherd, you know, has a staff where he guides the sheep, but he also has to pull out the rod sometime if the sheep keeps trying to run away. And I needed that from him. It's quite the story you have, and it's very um, inspiring and heartwarming to see everything that happened. But I want to circle back to what happened in the beginning, because this whole story started with what your biological dad had done to you. So... That night, you said, I'm willing to do anything. I don't want to be here again, God. So what happened? Did you end up forgiving your biological dad for what he had done to you? Yes, um, I do. And I forgive him now. And not only do I forgive him, but I pray for his salvation. And um, I want to say I fully said out loud and I fully said it in my heart about two or three months after I left the strip club. So as soon as I left the strip club and I came back from that church service, the following Monday, me and my boyfriend became my fiance. We got our marriage license. And that whole week, you know, he was in the living room and I was in the bedroom and we did it right that whole week. And then um, after we got our marriage license, we had to wait 24 hours to go to the courthouse and get married. So we ended up getting married and recommitting to the church and there was another retreat that had came and real talk kim um was a guest speaker at this retreat and she was speaking about her in pain and during that retreat service during that altar call i was like god i forgive him 
and I said it out loud. And not only did I said it out loud, and I was like, God, and I pray that you would save him. I pray that he would come to repentance and really, really, really repent for what he did, God. Change his life around God. But I have one request from you, Lord. I pray that when I finally tell my mother, because I know she's going to confront him, I pray that he doesn't deny it. And so years went by before I even told my mother. I would pray for him to get saved. I would pray for my sister's heart. The first people I told was my sister, the one who led me to Christ the first time. She had told me about a similar story of how he tried to do something, you know, with her one time. Mm -hmm. And then I told my other sister, then I told my pastor, then I told some, you know, so I started gaining that confidence of speaking out. And I feel like the more that I spoke out, the more that I told my truth was the more that I got healed internally. And there were, you know, sessions where I had to go through deliverance, where I had to have demons get casted out of me. Because when you go through a traumatic incident like that, or you go through rape and molestation, there's demonic spirits that get transferred into you from the bloodline, from the assaults. So during my healing process, as I was releasing out loud, as I was confessing, as if I was declaring that I forgive him, that I'm fully healed, that this won't transfer out to my bloodline, the Lord shut my womb. He did not allow me to get pregnant because he was like, I'm going to redeem your bloodline, Amanda. And during those three to four years that I was going through infertility, I was getting multiple demons casted out of me. There was this one time where a preacher came and she told her story of how she got molested. And it was during that session where I got complete, total freedom. There must have been at least seven demons that came out of me that day. I'm talking about my wow. fingers were bending back. I was talking like a man. You know, it was painful for them to come out. And they were coming out of my womb. They were coming out of my, you know, private parts. So once I got freed, once I got delivered from all those demonic spirits, once I got delivered from all the open doors that I had opened during my time where I was backslidden, then the Lord had allowed me to get pregnant, conceive. And finally, when I was at a point when God was like, okay, now you're ready. Now you're ready to minister. Now you're ready to talk is when I was like, okay, I got to share my story. But before I share my story to the world, I got to share it to my mom. That's true. Because during this whole time that I was going through this, my mom was in and out of the hospital. And it was this cycle. And finally, when the Lord was like, okay, you're healed enough to tell your story from a healed place. I was like, okay, Lord, but I have to tell her. And he was like, okay. And I remember praying. And I remember telling her. And she, she was shocked. She was speechless. She took it better than what the enemy had put in my head. How, of how she was going to take it. I thought she was going to be rolling around, falling on the floor, like panicking, hyperventilating, but she took it rather okay. And I feel like I needed that because I feel like if she would have freaked out on me, I would have freaked out. But she took it rather okay. And I knew she was going to call him. I knew she was going to track him down. I just know my mom. But I told God, Father, I pray that when she confronts him, because I know she is, because you know my mom, she's Puerto Rican, that he <laughs> would not deny me or shame me. And sure enough, my mom called him that next day. You know, she cursed him out in front of him and his new wife and stuff, but he didn't deny it. And my mom, you know, once I said what I said, she's never been back to the hospital. Once I confessed to my mom my deep, dark secret, she has not been admitted to the hospital since. She, um, she's healing. You know, we fixed our relationship. We're like in a season of healing together. You know, and we're, I'm finally able to like get close to her and talk to her. And I want to just say this because there was a process after I told her where I felt like all she could see was what had happened to me. And I confronted her before. I, I was so used to keeping my mouth shut. But now I confronted her and I was like, mom, 
I know that you're healing from this, but I'm not what happened to me. And if we're going to get moved past this, then I need you to learn or, or, or try to forgive him, forgive yourself. She held so much guilt in. And I walked her through that process and I was like, I'm not angry at you. I'm not upset with you. I know you were young. You were 13, you know, when all of this was happening, like you were a baby yourself. And I felt like throughout the years, I had so much um, compassion and understanding for my mom because of her backstory and because of all the pain that she had went through. I was, it was never of, oh, I hated my mom or like I loved her and I wanted to protect her, which is why I stayed silent for so long. But I knew protecting her now was telling her the truth and getting her freedom, not only in the natural, but in the spiritual realm. And once we hashed all of this out, she's never been admitted to the hospital again. She has minimal pain. She has, you know, beautiful grandchildren. She's living her life like she has you could see the life back in her face again. And it's just like a new layer of healing. And this goes for anyone who's watching right now, who maybe you've gone through a sim similar situation as my story. Maybe you're finding yourself in a situation where you're like, man, God, this wasn't fair. What happened to me? And, and maybe you're yourself having a battle with God, or maybe you just don't know God, but something terrible, something bad happened to you in your childhood or past. I want you to know that God can take all of that hurt, all of that pain, and turn it around for your good. There's a price for healing. And every time you overcome something in your life, God uses that to bless and set other people free. I'm so thankful that God did not allow me to stay stuck in that place at the strip club, to stay stuck, you know, in the bondage of needing to use drugs to numb the pain that was inside of me. You know, because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be where he has me now. You know, speaking to women who've gone through um, rape, who've gone through molestation, who, who you know, been possessed by demons and, and helping them get set free. God used the most ugly part of my story and he turned it around for beauty. And now he uses that to help other women heal, to help other women heal from soul wounds and trauma that they kept bottled up inside. And can I tell you that God wants to do the same thing for you? There's a story inside of you that he can unlock, that he can set you free and heal you from so that you can go back and set another sister free. Someone else in the world who's going through the same things that you've already overcome. That's the glory. And that's why I go so hard after God. It's not because um, I was forced to go to church because it's he really showed me his heart. And he really showed me that we love because he first loved us. He loved me while I was a stripper. He loved me while I was on cocaine. He loved me while I was high, while I was drunk. And he would get into my car and he would chase me down. And it's just like... I lived out that scripture that says that he leaves the 99 to go after that one sheep that got away. And I want you to know that if you're feeling alone right now, that he hasn't forgotten about you. And it's a look out because he's on his way for you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Almost False Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more interviews like this. If you found this content valuable, please share it with a friend. It really helps us out a lot and hopefully it will help them too. If you want to be on the show, you can go to almostfalls.net and submit your story there. We would love to hear from you. With that being said, I hope you have a great rest of your day and stay blessed.